This is The Rooted Podcast, a conversation about the Christian worldview and its implications for every part of life. The Rooted Podcast is hosted by Steve Royce and Brady Johnson. Together, they have over two decades of experience in the business and tech industries and share a desire to help others filter all of life through the Christian faith. Hi, and thanks for listening to The Rooted Podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Brady. And on this episode, we're going to be chatting a little bit more about Hebrew cosmology uh, or Hebrew worldview, as we can also call not it. Not cosmetology. And not cosmetology. I told Steve. <laughs> uh, my mom, she uh, she had always been in cosmetology growing up, you know, doing hair and, and nails and all that fun stuff. And so every time he would say the word cosmology, my brain kept saying, no, it's cosmetology. But yeah. that's a completely different thing. We're not talking about Hebrew haircuts today. Man, that'd be an interesting topic. <laughs> just I just don't happen to know anything about it. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to save that for later. So we'll yeah. do cosmology instead. Yeah, sounds good to me. So Steve did a great job on a uh, three-part uh, for this week of October. Uh, it starts on the 12th, the 14th, and the 16th. And that's going to be episodes 111, 113, and 115 on the fruit snack. So if you haven't listened to those, uh, definitely rewind back and give them a listen. So I think to get started, if you want to give us a quick recap, Steve, I mean, we can get into each of them individually, or if you just want to do the whole thing, you know, as a entire spiel, you know, but we have the heavens, the earth and the seas and this idea of, of Hebrew context and, and the way they saw the world. And so you've, you've said a lot to me about this. That was really eye opening, And I think the fruit snacks cover it pretty well as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I'll probably just for the sake of time, just kind of hit it all in one big package deal. Uh, and I'll just go ahead right up front and plug once again, the book. <laughs> I had to look, I never remember the title <laughs> scripture and cosmology by Kyle Greenwood. It is a fantastic read on this. If this is an interesting topic for you and uh, a lot of his insights are just, they're just really great. Uh, so the idea is that the ancient peoples of the world, not just the Israelites, but all ancient peoples had a certain way of understanding and viewing creation. And obviously it was very different than how you and I and pretty much anyone in the modern era, especially post enlightenment would understand the world. But even as far back as, in Galileo and, and all these uh, changes to how we understood the cosmos uh, are radically different than how the uh, ancients would have understood the cosmos. And so part of that is just getting back into their headspace and in trying to read and understand scripture through that lens, because God did not deem it necessary to correct their scientific understanding of the world uh, before giving them the inspiration to write scripture. And so that should tell us something in and of itself is that maybe, maybe getting it scientifically accurate, I'm not going to say isn't important because I think where scripture speaks to science, it it is accurate. But I I think moreover, the, the bigger point is that scientific accuracy is not actually the point of the text that there is a different message altogether that the messaging of scripture is almost always primarily theological not scientific and so uh, that may be kind of a duh but the bible is a theological book not a scientific book and so as we look at the hebrew cosmology in particular The world, according to their view of things, is broken up into basically three parts. It's the the heavens, the earth, and the sea. But what they mean by those things is pretty radically different from how you and I would conceive of them. Like for them, the heavens not only were the skies, but the, uh, the, the realm of the planets and the stars. And then even beyond that, there was this thing called the firmament, which again, in their thinking was this solid sort of vaulted dome or like the top of a tent. And it was solid and porous. 
and it was above the firmament that these sort of waters above were held back by this solid thing. And the uh, amount of water that was allowed through the, the firmament so crops could be watered and things like that was directly in control of, uh, of God. And beyond the firmament also was the heavenly realm. So in their thinking, and it's different again than how we would conceive of it, you, the birds are sort of the closest thing to us on earth because they sort of can cross between the heavens and the earth, but they don't go up very high. You also have the clouds. And then because of this idea of the firmament in their mind, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the heavenly bodies, the planets were actually closer to us than the, the top of the firmament because we could see them. I mean, if, if you think about the sky as being sort of a solid uh, veil, then anything that you can see in the sky, whether during the day or the night, is on our side of the curtain. And it is everything is on that's on the other side of the curtain is higher. It's further away from us. And so that would be the heavenly realm, the, the unseen realm. And so uh, there was water up there as the uh, Bible even talks about that, that there are these storehouses of snow and and of water, and the idea is that precipitation from above is in God's control. It's on the other side of the firmament. God literally opens up these these gates or these windows in heaven and allows water to come down through from His uh, storehouses up there. And then the earth itself is sort of this flat disk that was suspended over the the cosmic bottomless water, this abyss, which man has all kinds of connotations in scripture. It represented, you know, the chaotic forces. It represented the place of death and destruction and darkness and separation. It, it just had all sorts of meaning attached to it. And the earth was suspended on pillars that God put in place that held it up from falling down into the abyss and so the earth just sort of finds itself in the middle, the abyss and the, the waters below or below, and then the heavens and the waters above or above, and the earth sits right there in the middle. And as far as they were concerned, everything that existed could be encompassed into that. They had no concept of not only a solar system, but of galaxies and of nebulas and of just a whole expanding universe. That, that was just completely out of their realm of, uh, of thought. And so when we read scripture, it really doesn't make sense to look at it and interpret it through that kind of a lens, thinking in terms of modern, uh, scientific understanding of the universe of particle physics of an expanding universe and, you know, cosmic redshift and all these other scientific things that we know about today because of, because of what we're able to observe with telescopes and, and so on and so forth. It's just the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And when, when you read about those, especially when they're used together in conjunction in Scripture, it is it is shorthand. It's sort of a euphemism for everything that exists because in their thinking, that was everything that existed. So to, to give an example of this, and this is one of the ones that we've already looked at, but if we go back and we look at uh, Psalm 8, we see an example of this in Psalm 8, 7, and Eight, that when, well, let me back up to verse six. So Psalm eight, six, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. So notice there, all things under his feet. And then verses seven and eight sort of describe all things. So what are all things? Verse seven, all sheep and oxen and also all beasts of the field. So that's the earth. Then verse eight, all birds of the heavens. That's the heavens. And then all fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. So right there, you've put all things under his feet, and in the psalmist's mind, that encompass, that's encompassed by describing the earth, the heavens, and the sea. That's everything. And so you can even see right there in, uh, in this one example how the Hebrew thinking was these three parts are, are everything that exists, and uh, therefore we can use that as a way of kind of describing how God is the ruler of everything. 
even though by today's standards, we would say, well, that's not, that's not accurate. You know, that's just basically describing the earth itself. And there's so much more. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The point of the, the point of the scripture is that God, there's nothing that is not in God's direct control or dominion or purview that he's sovereign over everything that exists. And the fact that we know about more things that exist doesn't change the principle, which is still absolutely true from this Psalm that everything that does exist uh, is under God's control. And frankly, there's uh, what was it? C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. Just this idea that because we're further along in the timeline, we're better and we're more advanced and we know more. Guess what? If the Lord does not come back in 500 years, there's going to be people looking back at us thinking we were absolute hayseeds, right? Like we just knew absolutely nothing about the way things really were. And, and what's amazing about that is in that time, Psalm eight is still going to be true because it doesn't matter how much we know. The point is whatever it is, however much that exists, it's all under God's control. And that's why, like I was saying before, it is, I think not only better and more accurate, but also far less dangerous to interpret scripture in light of this original context, because what you get here is like the Bible is not trying to answer a scientific question about everything that exists being the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. The point is there's nothing that exists in all of creation that God doesn't rule over. And that will always be true. And so it's not beholden to our science or their science or 10,000 years from now science. It doesn't matter. And so it's answering a different question and therefore the scripture is timeless and, um, it just doesn't fall victim to any sort of, um, any sort of new revelation from scientific discovery or anything like that. It just, it's impervious to it, which I think is brilliant, um, obviously because God did it. So it's brilliant, but it also just frankly puts my mind and hopefully your mind at ease that, scripture is it's answering and asking different questions and so we don't really have to worry so much about this compatibility issue that just comes up again and again and again it is that um within its context properly understood uh, they're just they're ships passing in the night they're really not they're really not headed for this crash course that so many people think that uh that science and uh, and faith are yeah and I really like the way you put that to think about, you know, 500 years in the future, you know, people are going to look back at our belief and, and our observation through scientific, you know, methods that they have advanced on over the last 500 years and look back and say, well, they got this wrong. They completely misunderstood this. Yet scripture stands on its own. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't matter what whether we believe that we're this snow globe of a, a world, you know, sitting on the shelf versus, you know, uh a round rock in a, a space full of round rocks, you know, we're, yep. we're somewhere on that, that, I guess that spectrum of understanding through the scientific method, but, you know, scripture once understood in its context and understanding where, you know, the Hebrews were coming from and where they're thinking about uh, the world that they live in and the perspective they have on it. And Steve, you, you kind of blew my mind uh, when we talked about this, you know, this idea of, uh, Psalms 46, if you want to get into that a little bit, um, and frame the context as you did for me. Yeah, for sure. Before we do that, I just want to say, cause as you were talking, it, it sparked another thought is the, if I could summarize what I said about the 500 years from now thing, a, a big key question to ask when we're talking about does scripture, you know, line up with science, a question that doesn't get asked often enough is who's science. Mm -hmm. Um, are we talking about science from 2000 years ago? Are we talking about, you know, uh, Aristotelian, uh, you know, heavenly bodies physics? Are we talking about Galileo science? Are we talking about Copernicus or Newton? Are we talking about Einstein? Are we talking about Hawking Are, are we and dark matter? Like what, what whose science are we using as the standard here? Because science is constantly in flux. Yep. And even if we look today, I mean, gosh, if you go back 10 years, <laughs> yeah. if you look at not only the science of cosmology and how much more we understand and how actually our, our measurements have gotten so precise now 
that the two dates that have often been given for the universe based on different measurements, um, there used to be a overlap within the margin of error between those two numbers. They were different numbers, but there was enough margin of error overlap where like, well, it's somewhere in between. Our calculations have gotten increasingly precise as it happens to the point now where the margin of error for both of these numbers no longer overlaps, meaning that at least one, but maybe both of the ways that we understand the age of the universe are just flat wrong. Right. There's something we don't yet understand about physics or about dark matter or about the quantum stuff or you know whatever. Um, we're missing at least one major, major piece of the puzzle and we have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. So just to, to say that, well, science is the Bible needs to comport with science at all times. Science doesn't comport with science at all times. Like it's, it's constantly in flux and changing. And that's why I love that the Bible just frankly skirts around the whole issue and says, I'm not answering that question mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with that. The, the point is, is, is it all is under God's control. And if you happen to believe that you live in a snow globe and you read Psalm eight and you come to the conclusion that everything in that snow globe is under God's control, guess what? You are properly worshiping and praising God mm -hmm. under the same principle. And so it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't matter. Your, uh, your limited understanding of all that exists, only God understands fully all that exists, all that he made. Yeah. And so that is, um, that's a, it's just cool that, uh, that understanding scripture is not, uh, dependent on us having a perfect understanding of everything as God made it. We just have to understand that whatever he made, he's in charge of. So move into Psalm 46, because, uh, it's going to be a while if we keep the pace we're doing with the fruit snacks, even so it's, it's still going to be a long time before we get to Psalm 46. So, I'm okay with a spoiler because who knows, it'll be probably a couple of years of fruit snacks before we actually get there. And by then you'll maybe have forgotten about this. <laughs> so uh, Psalm 46 is another great example of this Hebrew cosmology sort of in action where you just see it in the context of how a Hebrew would think about it. And the overall uh, message or theme of this Psalm is very similar to Psalm 8 is that God's in control. Uh, God is our fortress. He's our strength. He's our refuge is what you see in, in verse one. And, uh, so I'll just, I'll just start reading here because you're going to start to see and hear, um, imagery of this Hebrew cosmology that's in here. And then we're going to get into sort of what's going on within their mind and their thinking compared to how we would think about it. So starting in verse one to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to, uh, Alamoth, a song, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Uh, and so I'm, I'll, uh, I'll stop reading there. There's more of sort of the same thing about God's control over the nations and um, his sovereignty there. But in the first uh, really verses two through five, I guess, you get these uh, images, this reference to the earth to the mountains to the sea this cosmological language and again as moderns we would look at this and probably think something to the effect of you know if i'm picturing in my mind oh i won't fear though the earth gives way or the mountains move into the heart of the sea i'm probably picturing some sort of natural disaster right i'm picturing like an earthquake or maybe a tsunami some sort of like you know seismic activity and the fault lines are crumbling and like a big, big earthquake, the whole, a whole mountain range maybe like collapses or falls down. That's a big deal. And there would certainly be a huge, um, loss of life associated with that. And that would be scary. And while it's not wrong to look at something like that kind of a scenario and just conclude, Hey, I can still trust God. Even if, even if something crazy like that happens, if there's like a 
record shattering earthquake along some fault line and, you know, huge natural disaster happens, wipes out a bunch of people. God is still trustworthy. But I would I would contend that based on what the Hebrew cosmology is uh, in in cultural context here, that that is thinking far, far too small. And so if we consider the fact that in the Hebrew worldview, again, the earth is sitting over the, the sea, the cosmic sea, this abyss, and, and above is the firmament and the firmament is solid. And so it needs to be suspended up there. It needs to be held up. And the ancients pretty much concluded that the mountains that they could see were the best candidate for what in the world is holding up the firmament. What's keeping it because it's solid from crashing down on top of us. What's the mountains? Because these, some of these mountains were, you know, not summitable, uh, especially in the ancient world. Why, Why would you go up there? You would just go up there and you would die if you could even climb it. They were inhospitable to life. And so you just didn't go there just like the open ocean in, in a lot of ways. It's just these things represented places you just didn't go. This is why they were associated with the realm of the gods. So anyway, in if this is right, if I'm tracking correctly on the Hebrew worldview here, then when the psalmist is saying that we will not fear though the earth gives way, what is it giving way to? What would How in the world would the earth give way? Well, the only really way that that makes sense is if the pillars that are holding up the earth somehow collapse. And what is happening at that point to the earth? I mean, just picture it in your head. You've got this sort of flat disc. I picture, I'm picturing like a a rice cake for some reason, (laughs) but it's, it's that kind of idea, right? And what happens to that if the pillars that are holding it and suspending it up over the bottomless pit suddenly give way? Well, it's just going to sink. It's going to fall down into the abyss. Moreover, if that weren't bad enough, he continues, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. So not only is the earth falling into the abyss, the mountains are also crumbling and falling into the abyss as well. So what does that mean? If if the earth falls into the, uh, the sea, that's bad. But if the mountains fall, what's holding up the firmament? Like nothing, which means that we are literally in like chicken little territory now, right? The sky is falling because there's nothing to hold it up. And so the psalmist is not picturing some sort of natural disaster where, oh, it's a really bad earthquake and there's some flooding. He's picturing the end of existence. The earth is is no more. The earth is falling into the abyss and the mountains crumble and the firmament And the heavens are literally crashing down on top of the earth. Creation is being snuffed out. Uh, It it would be the closest thing that we could even probably describe it uh, or compare it to would be like if suddenly the earth found itself in the orbit of like a black hole and we were just going to get sucked into uh, a black hole and just basically blink out of existence. And the, the earth is just it's just gone. It's just not there anymore. And what the psalmist is saying, I want us to kind of picture this is this is like not, oh, something bad happened. This is like existential terror, right? Like everything's just gone. It's just gone. There, It doesn't exist anymore. And it's within that context that the psalmist is writing, God is our refuge and strength and he will help us. Mm-hmm. And, and if you continue into verses four and five, you see that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. So I want us to think for a second about anywhere in the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, where, so so think about this language for a sec, dude. Um, you have a place where God lives. This is God's house, his abode. And there is, uh, God is in the midst of it. And there are rivers and streams that proceed from it. Does that remind you of anything in the Old Testament? Yeah, we're talking about the garden. Yeah, we're talking about Eden because Eden is described as a garden and a mountain. 
And Eden is also described as a place where, so God is there. God walks through the garden. Mm -hmm. He is in fellowship with Adam and Eve. And it is basically his headquarters on earth. And it's described as a place where you have these rivers, um, these four rivers proceeding out from it. So I think what the psalmist is referencing here is basically a sort of a heavenly version, a version of Eden, but this is sort of the heavenly version of Eden that, um, God is there wherever God is, that's his abode and it's perfect. And notice what he says about it in verse five, she shall not be moved, meaning that wherever God is, no matter what else is happening, creation could be blinking out of existence. All the rest of it could be falling and crashing down and just not existing anymore. Wherever God is, is we're, we're going to be fine. If we're with God, if we're uh, in his presence, then we're going to be safe. It doesn't matter what happens around us. It doesn't matter what happens to us. If we are gods, if we belong to him, then wherever God is, God's not worried. Yeah. He, nothing's going to happen that's going to gonna shake or tremble God and, and, and move him off his throne. So it's this amazing picture when you look at it within the context of the greater cosmology of far it's far more profound of a picture than um than what we what we tend to think of yeah and you know going through all that you know when you first kind of brought this to my attention and and walked me through from this context it really it blew my mind like i said earlier is you know it really put it into a perspective that you know when you're reading through scripture and i know we talked about this in our last uh rooted uh podcast but you know, when you look through the context of, you know, whoever's writing or whatever the event might be, you really see things from a different perspective. You know, it's not that surface level, you know, Bible study of, oh, what does this mean to you? You know, what are the words saying? You know, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, you're really grasping and understanding, oh, this is what they were thinking. This is, yeah. this is how they saw the world. And, and they're not just saying, you know, if there's a, like you said, if there's just a natural disaster, you know, God will get us through it. It's like, no, if, if, if everything's destroyed, if everything crumbles beneath our feet and we fall into the abyss, God's in control. God yeah. is sovereign. Uh, and like you said, cannot be moved. And it's really it's just, a much more profound level of dependence and yeah. faith than even what we're thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Like no matter what happens, God's got it. It's like, we're not picturing the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. Right. right. I just can't help, but quote that lyric. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, um, I, I, and again, I, I just really feel like there is more there below the surface than what you and I would just naturally look at it because we approach things from our post enlightenment perspective Mm -hmm. and they just had a different perspective. And I think what he's saying there is just, it's really big. It's a big idea. And frankly, I mean, for me, when I first had that observation and kind of started to have the oh wow like moment of what i think is going on here in this psalm it it's uh it's an overwhelming thought for sure but it also has this i think secondary side effect of really prompting me to 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 worship but also to have a a level of dependence on god that i just don't currently have where i just kind of go wow that's that's a whole other level several levels above where we tend to sort of place our faith in in god and um yeah it's just it's uh it's a challenge it's a good challenge and it's i think a good reminder and and it just helps us to kind of i think better orient ourselves toward how god really wants us to think about him to say listen you should be able to trust me no matter what, even right. if all of existence is blinked out. I, I promised you, didn't I? Right. Like, and, and this is where it comes back to just belief. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he promised us that if we trust in Jesus and his work, then we will inherit eternal life that we will be with him forever. And it kind of boils down to, do you trust me or don't you? And, and it shouldn't matter what else is happening. Do we trust God or don't we? Right. And, and the, the level of trust that I see just kind of portrayed by the psalmist here is, is kind of staggering. This is, I think 
this is sort of the the kind of faith that it talks about in the New Testament where Jesus marveled at it, right? Mm-hmm. Where he even Jesus was kind of back on his heels like, wow, wow, you you get it. You really get it. And most people do not get it. And you just, there's a level of understanding and just profound trust and belief that uh, Jesus didn't find very much of here. But I see it in this psalm and I just think it's really neat. Yeah. No, that's great. And, you know, going back to our last conversation about, you know, the context and thinking about, you know, you gave the example of uh, the lukewarm water. You know, talking about uh, Laodicea and it's just, it's one of those things that it really makes me want to emphasize and focus more on my studies that I'm getting more of the historical context and I'm, you know, doing more than just busting out the Bible that I'm getting into these other contexts, whatever it might be, whatever book. And I know we spent some time after recording, looking at some different softwares. I know you'd given some recommendations, yeah. um, but I'd just like to, I think, reiterate that you know, the importance of that, you know, both for myself as a reminder to myself, but, you know, for those of you listening, just how important it is to really get into that mindset and to do what we need to do through our studies to be focusing on these historical contexts, yeah, looking at it from their worldview um, so that we have a better understanding of what it is they're truly writing. Yeah, for sure. It, it not only will transform your Bible study, but it also will get you closer to the intended sort of principle that's being communicated to between the original writer and the original audience, which is just going to allow you and me to, to glean better, more biblically, uh, based applications. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've been, you know, part of a Bible study or heard someone say something that's like, okay, that is, that is biblically true. That's a principle, but you don't get that here. You Mm -hmm. don't get that out of this passage. So you'd have to go way over here to get it. The reason they're getting it here is because they're just sort of taking this face value. Mm -hmm. Oh, this reminds me of that other thing approach and then expounding upon it. It's like, but that's not, you're getting that, um, out of, from somewhere else besides this text, Mm -hmm. you're not getting it out of this text. So let's go into this text and let's really dig deep and, yeah, I mean, it, and it is work. We've talked about this plenty of times before, but most people think of Bible study as reading the Bible and then maybe reading a commentary or two or <laughs> yeah. something like that. But it's like, no, I mean, honestly, I think that you, just as much of your Bible study can be reading things that aren't the Bible because it helps you understand better what is being communicated in the Bible. For instance, if you're in the Old Testament and you're reading about David and Goliath, for instance, we're reading history on the Philistines, on mm-hmm. Gath, on the uh, the Nephilim and, and Goliath's tie to those giants uh, right back to Genesis 6 and how the giants and the Nephilim and all their associated clans were basically the targets. They were public enemy number one during the conquest narratives in Joshua and why was that and and all of this leads up to David and Goliath where David is the one to snuff out the last of th- this line of um basically aberrant creation mm-hmm. and the theological implications that that has and all these other things plus just the geography plus the the cultural practices who were the Philistine gods? We know about Dagon because it's recorded uh, that that incident with the Ark of the Covenant being taken by the Philistines back to and put in that temple. But who who was Dagon? What did he represent to the Philistines? And why is it significant that uh, Yahweh defeated him in the way that he did when he knocked over his statue and broke his limbs and his head off and all these other things, right? And so just reading about getting historical context, cultural context, even geographical context is all, it's all just going to help you paint the picture and it's going to make more things make more sense, which is just going to help all the way around. And so can't really recommend it highly enough. It's just, um, it is work, but honestly it's, it's once you get into it, I, I think it can be really fun to, to arrive at these like aha moments that you wouldn't have if you hadn't taken the time to do this and you just read it and go, 
Uh huh. That that that's kind of cool. It reminds me of this other thing over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, uh, you know, going through school, history was one one of the areas where I probably struggled the most and had the least interest in. But I find now as an adult that it's it's something I take far more seriously, and I I tend to do a lot more research on now. Mm-hmm. Um, wishing I had you know cared more when I was younger. Yeah. So for those that are more interested and have been more interested in history, I think this might come a little more naturally. Um, but, yeah. you know, as you just mentioned, I think, you know, the aha moments that you get, you know, as we just went through, you know, Psalms 46, you can see kind of that aha moment. It really does uh, build a, a beautiful perspective on things. So. Yeah. And it's never too late to start. So, yeah, it was uh, someone I can't remember the the quote exactly, but, you know, like the the best time to, to start was like five years ago. The second best time to start is right now. Yeah. So <laughs> it's in a similar way. It's kind of the things, you know, the best time to be doing this kind of Bible study was, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, however, old, you know, insert number here, but the second best time is right now. Yeah. So if you are excited by this idea or you're encouraged to uh, dive in and look a little more closely, then, uh, more power to you. We'll, we just pray that, uh, that, God's spirit will reveal more truth to you, uh, through this, that you will arrive at just keener, uh, biblical insight. And that then in turn, you're going to be able to use that to not only encourage your, your walk with Christ, but also to encourage others and challenge them. And that it'll just, that that we'll all grow as a result. I think that's really the, the main goal of this whole whole podcast is that as a result of this, it's not just about head knowledge, but that you will, grow in your uh, desire to know more about scripture, but that it also is going to directly lead to moments of worship and praise um, to moments of awe over who God is. And then to just uh, increase in, in how much you have your hope, your encouragement on a daily basis, and just your trust in God that if we, if we, uh, if we can do all those things, then it, then it'll have been absolutely, absolutely worth it. Yeah. Amen. That's our Hebrews haircut in a nutshell. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. And, uh, and if this doesn't work out, you can always look at, uh, cosmetology instead. <laughs> yeah. Thanks all for right. listening. Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us on the rooted podcast, a creation of rooted productions and an affiliate of the Oasis church in Gilbert, Arizona. For more information about the podcast, or to submit a question or comment, please visit us at rooted.productions. Follow us on Instagram at rooted.productions or email podcast at rooted.productions. That's rooted.productions. We hope you'll join us next time.